Chapter 8 of Triplanetary, first in the Lensman series by E. E. Doc Smith. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Chenever. Chapter 8 In Roger's Planetoid. In the hall, Cleo glanced around her wildly, seeking even the narrowest avenue of escape. Before she could act, however, her body was clamped as though in a vice, and she struggled motionless. It is useless to attempt to escape, or to do anything except what Roger wishes, the guide informed her somberly, snapping off the instrument in her hand, and thus restoring to the thoroughly cowed girl her freedom of motion. His lightest wish is law, she continued as they walked down a long corridor. The sooner you realize that you must do exactly as he pleases in all things, the easier your life will be. But I wouldn't want to keep on living. Cleo declared with a flash of spirit, and I can always die, you know. You will find that you cannot. The passionless creature returned monotonously. If you do not yield, you will long and pray for death, but you will not die unless Roger wills it. Look at me. I cannot die. Here is your apartment. You will stay here until Roger gives further orders concerning you. The living automaton opened a door, and stood silent and impassive, while Cleo, staring at her in horror, shrank past her and into the sumptuously furnished suite. The door closed soundlessly, and utter silence descended as a pall. Not an ordinary silence, but the indescribable perfection of the absolute silence, complete absence of all sound. In that silence Cleo stood motionless. Tense and rigid, hopeless, despairing, she stood there in that magnificent room, fighting an almost overwhelming impulse to scream. Suddenly she heard the cold voice of Roger, speaking from the empty air. You are overwrought, Miss Marston. You can be of no use to yourself or to me in that condition. I command you to rest, and to ensure that rest, you may pull that cord, which will establish about this room an ether wall, a wall to cut off even this, my voice. The voice ceased as she pulled the cord savagely, and threw herself upon a divan in a torrent of gasping, strangling, but rebellious sobs. Then again came a voice, but not to her ears. Deep within her, pervading every bone and muscle, it made itself felt rather than heard. Cleo? it asked. Don't talk yet. Conway! she gasped in relief. Every fiber of her being thrilled into new hope at the deep, well-remembered voice of Conway Costigan. Keep still, he snapped. Don't act so happy. He may have a spy ray on you. He can't hear me. But he may be able to hear you. When he was talking to you, you must have noticed a sort of rough, sandpapery feeling under that necklace I gave you. Since he's got an ether wall around you, the beads are dead now. If you feel anything like that under the wrist watch, breathe deeply twice. If you don't feel anything there, it's safe for you to talk as loud as you please. I don't feel anything, Conway, she rejoiced. Tears forgotten, she was her old buoyant self again. So that wall is real, after all. I only about half believed it. Don't trust it too much, because he can cut it off from the outside any time he wants to. Remember what I told you. That necklace will warn you of any spy ray in the ether, and the watch will detect anything below the level of the ether. It's dead now, of course, since our three phones are direct connected. I am in touch with Bradley, too. Don't be too scared. We've got a lot better chance than I thought we had. What? You don't mean it. Absolutely. I'm beginning to think that maybe we've got something he doesn't know exists. Our ultra-wave. Of course, I wasn't surprised when his searchers failed to find our instruments, but it never occurred to me that I might have a clear field to use them in. I can't quite believe it yet, but I haven't been able to find any indication that he can even detect the bands we are using. I'm going to look around over there with my spy ray. I'm looking at you now. Feel it? Yes, the watch feels that way now. Fine. Not a sign of interference over here, either. I can't find a trace of ultra-wave, anything below ether level, you know, anywhere in the whole place. He's got so much stuff that we've never heard of that I supposed, of course, he'd have ultra-wave, too, 
But if he hasn't, that gives us the edge. Well, Bradley and I have got a lot of work to do. Wait a minute, I just had a thought. I'll be back in about a second. There was a brief pause, then the soundless but clear voice went on. Good hunting. That woman that gave you the blue willies isn't alive. She's full of the prettiest machinery and circuits you ever saw. Oh, Conway! And the girl's voice broke in an engulfing wave of thanksgiving and relief. It was so utterly horrible, thinking of what must have happened to her and to others like her. He's running a colossal bluff, I think. He's good, all right, but he lacks quite a lot of being omnipotent. But don't get too cocky, either. Plenty has happened to plenty of women here, and men, too. And plenty may happen to us, unless we put out a few jets. Keep a stiff upper lip, and if you want us, yell. Bye. The silent voice ceased. The watch upon Cleo's wrist again became an unobtrusive timepiece, and Costigan, in his solitary cell far below her tower room, turned his peculiarly goggled eyes toward other scenes. His hands, apparently idle in his pockets, manipulated tiny controls. His keen, highly trained eyes studied every concealed detail of mechanism of the great globe. Finally he took off the goggles and spoke in a low voice to Bradley, confined in another windowless room across the hall. I think I've got dope enough, Captain. I found out where he put our armor and guns, and I've located all the main leads, controls, and generators. There are no ether walls around us here, but every door is shielded, and there are guards outside our doors, one to each of us. They're robots, not men. That makes it harder, since they're undoubtedly connected direct to Roger's desk, and will give an alarm at the first hint of abnormal performance. We can't do a thing until he leaves his desk. See that black panel, a little below the court switch to the right of your door? That's the conduit cover. When I give you the word, tear that off and you'll see one red wire in the cable. It feeds the shield generator for your door. Break that wire and join me out in the hall. Sorry, I had only one of these ultra-wave spies, but once we're together it won't be so bad. Here's what I thought we could do. And he went over in detail the only course of action which his survey had shown to be possible. There, he's left his desk, Costigan exclaimed after the conversation had continued for almost an hour. Now as soon as we find out where he's going, we'll start something. He's going to see Cleo, the swine. Uh, this changes things, Bradley. His hard voice was a curse. Somewhat, blazed the captain. I know how you two have been getting on during all the cruise. I'm with you, but what can we do? We'll do something, Costigan declared grimly. If he makes a pass at her, I'll get him if I have to blow this whole sphere out of space with us in it. Don't do that, Conway. Cleo's low voice, trembling but determined, was felt by both men. If there's a chance for you to get away and do anything about fighting him, don't mind me. Maybe he only wants to talk about the ransom, anyway. He wouldn't talk ransom to you. He's going to talk something else entirely. Costigan gritted, then his voice changed suddenly. But, say, maybe it's just as well this way. They didn't find our specials when they searched us, you know, and we're going to do plenty of damage right soon now. Roger probably isn't a fast worker, more the cat-and-mouse type, I'd say. And after we get started, he'll have something on his mind beside you. Think you can stall him off and keep him interested for about fifteen minutes? I'm sure I can. I'll do anything to help us, or you, get away from this horrible— Her voice ceased as Roger broke the ether wall of her apartment and walked toward the divan upon which she crouched in wide-eyed, helpless, trembling terror. Get ready, Bradley, Costigan directed tersely. He left Cleo's ether wall off, so that any abnormal signals would be relayed to him from his desk. He knows there's no chance of anyone disturbing him in that room. But I'm holding a beam on that switch, so that the wall is on full strength. No matter what we do now, he can't get a warning. I'll have to hold the beam exactly in place, though, so you'll have to do the dirty work. Tear out that red wire and kill those two guards. You know how to kill a robot, don't you? Yes, break his eye lenses and his eardrums, and he'll stop whatever he's doing and send out distress calls. Got them both. Now what? Open my door. 
The shield switch is to the right. Costigan's door flew open, and the triplanetary captain leaped into the room. Now for our armor, he cried. Not yet, snapped Costigan. He was standing rigid, goggled eyes, staring immovably at a spot on the ceiling. I can't move a millimeter until you closed Cleo's ether wall switch. If I take this ray off it for a second, we're sunk. Five floors up, straight ahead, down a corridor, fourth door on right. When you're at the switch, you'll feel my ray on your watch. Snap it up. Right. And the captain leaped away at a pace to be equaled by few men of half his years. Soon he was back, and after Costigan had tested the ether wall of the bridal suite to make sure that no warning signal from his desk or his servants could reach Roger within it, the two officers hurried away toward the room in which their space armor was. Too bad they don't wear uniforms, panted Bradley, short of breath from the many flights of stairs. Might have helped some as disguise. I doubt it. With so many robots around, they've probably got signals that we couldn't understand anyway. If we meet anybody, it'll mean a battle. Hold it. Peering through walls with his spy ray, Costigan had seen two men approaching, blocking an intersecting corridor into which they must turn. Two of them, a man and a robot. The robot's on your side. We'll wait here, right at the corner. When they round it, take them. And Costigan put away his goggles in readiness for strife. All unsuspecting, the two pirates came into view, and as they appeared, the two officers struck. Costigan, on the inside, drove a short, hard right low into the human pirate's abdomen. The fiercely driven fist sank to the wrist into the soft tissues, and the stricken man collapsed. But even as the blow landed, Costigan had seen that there was a third enemy following close behind the two he had been watching, a pirate who was even then training a ray projector upon him. Reacting automatically, Costigan swung his unconscious opponent around in front of him so that it was into an enemy's body that the vicious ray tore, and not into his own. Crouching down into the smallest possible compass, he straightened out with the lashing force of a mighty steel spring, hurling the corpse straight at the flaming mouth of the projector. The weapon crashed to the floor, and dead pirate and living went down in a heap. Upon that heap, Costigan hurled himself, feeling for the pirate's throat. But the fellow had wriggled clear, and countered with a gouging thrust that would have torn out the eyes of a slower man, following it up instantly with a savage kick for the groin. No automaton this, geared and set to perform certain fixed duties with mechanical precision, but a lithe, strong man in hard training, fighting with every foul trick known to his murderous ilk. But Costigan was no trio in the art of dirty fighting. Few indeed were the maiming tricks of foul combat unknown to even the rank and file of the highly efficient undercover branch of the Triplanetary Service, and Costigan, a sector chief, knew them all. Not for pleasure, sportsmanship, nor million-dollar purses did those secret agents use nature's weapons. They came to grips only when it could not possibly be avoided, but when they were forced to fight in that fashion, they went in with but one grim purpose, to kill, and to kill in the shortest possible space of time. Thus it was that Costigan's opening soon came. The pirate launched a vicious coup de sabot, which Costigan avoided by a lightning shift. It was a slight shift, barely enough to make the kicker miss and two powerful hands closed upon that flying foot in mid-air like the sprung jaws of a bear trap, closed and twisted viciously in the same fleeting second. There was a shriek, smothered as a heavy boot crashed to its carefully predetermined mark. The pirate was out, definitely and permanently. The struggle had lasted scarcely ten seconds coming to its close, just as Bradley finished blinding and deafening the robot. Costigan picked up the projector, again donned his spy-ray goggles, and the two hurried on. Nice work, Chief. It must be a gift to rough house the way you do. That's why you took the live one? Practice helps some, too. I've been in brawls before, and I'm a lot younger and maybe a bit faster than you are. Costigan explained briefly, penetrating gaze rigidly to the fore as they ran along one corridor after another. 
Several more guards, both living and mechanical, were encountered on the way, but they were not permitted to offer any opposition. Costigan saw them first. In the furious beam of the projector of the dead pirate, they were riven into nothingness, and the two officers sped on to the room which Costigan had located from afar. The three suits of triplanetary space armor had been locked up in a cabinet, a cabinet whose doors Costigan literally blew off with a blast of force rather than consume time in tracing the power leads. I feel like something now. Costigan, once more encased in his own armor, heaved a great sigh of relief. Rough and tumble's all right with one or two, but that generator room is full of grief, and we don't have any too much stuff as it is. We've got to take Cleo's suit along. We'll carry it down to the door of the power room, drop it there, and pick it up on the way back. Contemptuous now of possible guards, the armored pair strode toward the power plant, the very heart of the immense fortress of space. Guards were encountered, and captains, officers who signaled frantically to their chief, since he alone could unleash the frightful forces at his command, and who profanely wondered at his unwanted silence. But the enemy beams were impotent against the ether walls of that armor, and the pirates, without armor in the security of their own planetoid as they were, vanished utterly in the ravening beams of the twin Lewistons. As they paused before the door of the power room, both men felt Cleo's voice raised in her first and last appeal, an appeal wrung from her against her will by the extremity of her position. Conway, hurry! His eyes, they're tearing me apart. Hurry, dear! In the horror-filled tones, both men read clearly, however inaccurately, the girl's dire extremity. Each saw plainly a happy, carefree young earth girl, upon her first trip into space, locked inside an ether wall with an overbrained, underconscienced human machine, a superintelligent but lecherous and unmoral mechanism of flesh and blood, acknowledging no authority, ruled by nothing save his own scientific drivings and the almost equally powerful urges of his desires and passions. She must have fought with every resource at her command. She must have wept and pleaded, stormed and raged, feigned submission and played for time, and her torment had not touched in the slightest degree the merciless and gloating brain of the being who called himself Roger. Now his tantalizing, ruthless cat-play would be done. The horrible gray-brown face would be close to hers. She wailed her final despairing message to Costigan and attacked that hideous face with the fury of a tigress. Costigan bit off a bitter imprecation. Hold him just a second longer, sweetheart, he cried, and the power room door vanished. Through the great door the two Lewistons swept at full aperture and at maximum power, two rapidly opening fans of death and destruction. Here and there a guard, more rapid than his fellows, trained a futile projector, a projector whose magazine exploded at the touch of that frightful field of force, liberating instantaneously its thousands upon thousands of kilowatt-hours of stored-up energy. Through the delicately adjusted, complex mechanisms, the destroying beams tore. At their touch, armatures burned out, high-tension leads volatized in crashing high-voltage arcs, masses of metal smoked and burned in the path of vast forces now seeking the easiest path to neutralization. Delicate instruments blew up, copper ran in streams. As the last machine subsided into a semi-molten mass of metal, the two wreckers, each grasping a brace, felt themselves become weightless and knew that they had accomplished the first part of their program. Costigan leaped for the outer door. His the task to go to Cleo's aid. Bradley would follow more slowly, bringing the girl's armor, and taking care of any possible pursuit. As he sailed through the air, he spoke. Coming, Cleo. All right, girl? Questioningly, half fearfully. All right, Conway. Her voice was almost unrecognizable, broken in retching agony. When everything went crazy, he found out that the ether wall was up and forgot all about me. He shut it off and seemed to go crazy, too, 
he is floundering around like a wild man now. I'm trying to keep him from going downstairs. Good girl. Keep him busy one minute more. He's getting all the warnings at once and wants to get back to his board. But what's the matter with you? Did he hurt you after all? Oh, no, not that. He didn't do anything but look at me. But that was bad enough. But I'm sick, horribly sick. I'm falling. I'm so dizzy that I can scarcely see. My head is breaking up into little pieces. I just know I'm going to die, Conway. Oh, oh. Oh, is that all? In his sheer relief that they had been in time, Costigan did not think of sympathizing with Cleo's very real present distress of mind and body. I forgot that you're a ground gripper. That's just a little touch of space sickness. It'll wear off directly. All right, I'm coming. Let go of him and get as far away from him as you can. He was now in the street, perhaps two hundred feet distant, and a hundred feet above him was the tower room, in which were Cleo and Roger. He sprang directly toward its large window, and as he floated upward, he corrected his course and accelerated his pace by firing backward at various angles with his heavy service pistol, uncaring that at the point of impact of each of those shells a small blast of destruction erupted. He missed the window a trifle, but that did not matter. His flaming Lewiston opened a way for him, partly through the window, partly through the wall. As he soared through the opening, he trained projector and pistol upon Roger, now almost to the door, noticing as he did so that Cleo was clinging convulsively to a lamp bracket upon the wall. Door and wall vanished in the Lewiston's terrific beam, but the pirate stood unharmed. Neither ravening ray nor explosive shell could harm him. He had snapped on the protective shield, whose generator was always upon his person. When Cleo reported that Roger seemed to go crazy and was floundering around like a wild man, she had no idea of how she was understanding the actual situation. For Garlane of Edor, then energizing the form of flesh that was Roger, had for the first time in his prodigiously long life met in direct conflict with an overwhelming superior force. Roger had been sublimely confident that he could detect the use, anywhere in or around his planetoid, of ultra-wave. He had been equally sure that he could control directly and absolutely the physical activities of any number of these semi-intelligent human beings. But four Arisians in fusion, Drunli, Berlintine, Nedanelor, and Cretigan, had been on guard for weeks. When the time came to act, they acted. Roger's first thought, upon discovering what tremendous and inexplicable damage had already been done, was to destroy instantly the two men who were doing it. He could not touch them. His second was to blast out of existence this supposedly human female but no more could he touch her. His fiercest mental bolts spent themselves harmlessly three millimeters away from her skin. She gazed into his eyes completely unaware of the torrents of energy pouring from them. He could not even aim a weapon at her. His third was to call for help to Edor. He could not. The sub-ether was closed nor could he either discover the manner of its closing or trace the power which was keeping it closed. His Edorian body, even if he could recreate it here, could not withstand the environment. This Roger thing would have to do whatever it could, unaided by Garlane's mental powers. And physically it was a very capable body indeed. Also it was armed and armored with mechanisms of Garlane's own devising, and Edor's second-in-command was in no sense a coward. But Roger, while not exactly a ground-gripper, did not know how to handle himself without weight, whereas Costigan, given six walls against which to push, was even more efficient in weightless combat than when handicapped by the force of gravitation. Keeping his projector upon the pirate, he seized the first club to hand, a long slender pedestal of metal, launched himself past the pirate chief. With all the momentum of his mass and velocity and all the power of his good right arm, he swung the bar at the pirate's head. 
that fiercely driven mass of metal should have taken head from shoulders but it did not roger's shield of force was utterly rigid and impenetrable the only effect of the frightful blow was to set him spinning end over end like the flying baton of an acrobatic drum major as the spinning form crashed against the opposite wall of the room bradley floated in carrying cleo's armor without a word the captain loosened the helpless girl's grip upon the bracket and encased her in the suit then supporting her at the window he held his lewiston upon the captive's head while costigan propelled him toward the opening both men knew that roger's shield of force must be threatened every instant that if he were allowed to release it he probably would bring to bear a hand weapon even superior to their own braced against the wall costigan sighted along roger's body toward the most distant point of the lofty dome of the artificial planet and gave him a gentle push then each grasping cleo by an arm the two officers shoved mightily with their feet and the three armored forms darted away toward their only hope of escape an emergency boat which could be launched through the shell of the great globe to attempt to reach the hyperion and to escape in one of her lifeboats would have been useless they could not have forced the great gates of the main airlocks and no other exits existed as they sailed onward through the air costigan keeping the slowly floating form of roger enveloped in his beam cleo began to recover suppose they get their gravity fixed she asked apprehensively and they're raying us and shooting at us they may have it fixed already they undoubtedly have spare parts and duplicate generators but if they turn it on the fall will kill roger too and he wouldn't like that they'll have to get him down with a helicopter or something and they know we'll get them as fast as they come up they can't hurt us with hand weapons and before they can bring up any heavy stuff they'll be afraid to use it because we'll be too close to their shell i wish we could have brought roger along he continued savagely to bradley but you were right of course it'd be altogether too much like a rabbit capturing a wildcat my lewiston's about done right now and there can't be much left of yours what he'd do to us would be a sin and a shame now at the great wall the two men heaved mightily upon a lever the gate of the emergency port swung slowly open and they entered the miniature cruiser of the void costigan familiar with the mechanism of the craft from careful study from his prison cell manipulated the controls through gate after massive gate they went until finally they were out in open space shooting toward distant tellus at the maximum acceleration of which their small craft was capable costigan cut the other two phones out of the circuit and spoke his attention fixed upon some extremely distant point. Sams, he called sharply. Costigan, we're out. All right. Yes. Sure. Absolutely. You tell him, Sammy. I've got company here. Through the sound discs of their helmets, the girl and the captain had heard Costigan's share of the conversation. Bradley stared at his erstwhile first officer in amazement, and even Cleo had often heard that mighty, half-mythical name surely that bewildering young man must rank high to speak so familiarly with virgil sams the all-powerful head of the space-pervading service of the triplanetary league you've turned in a general call-out bradley stated rather than asked long ago i've been in touch right along costigan answered now that they know what to look for and know that ether wave detectors are useless they can find it every vessel in seven sectors clear down to scout patrols is concentrating on this point and the call is out for all battleships and cruisers afloat there are enough operatives out there with ultra waves to locate that globe and once they spot it they'll point it out to all the other vessels but how about the other prisoners asked the girl they'll be killed won't they hard telling costigan shrugged depends on how things turn out we lack a lot of being safe ourselves yet what's worrying me mostly is our own chance bradley assented they will chase us of course sure and they'll have more speed than we have depends on how far away the nearest triplanetary vessels are but we've done everything we can do for now silence fell and costigan cut in cleo's phone and came over to the seat upon which she was reclining white and stricken 
worn out by the horrible and terrifying ordeals of the last few hours. As he seated himself beside her, she blushed vividly, but her deep blue eyes met his gray ones steadily. Cleo, I, we, you, that is, he flushed hotly and stopped. This secret agent, whose clear, keen brain no physical danger could cloud, who had proved over and over again that he was never at a loss in any emergency, however desperate, this quick-witted officer floundered in embarrassment like any schoolboy, but continued doggedly. I'm afraid that I gave myself away back there, but... We gave ourselves away, you mean. She filled in the pause. I did my share, but I won't hold you to it if you don't want. But I know that you love me, Conway. Love you, the man groaned, his face lined and hard, his whole body rigid. That doesn't half tell it, Cleo. You don't need to hold me. I'm hell for life. There never was a woman who meant anything to me before. There never will be another. You're the only woman that ever existed. It isn't that. Can't you see that it's impossible? Of course I can't. It isn't impossible at all. She released her shields. Four hands met and tightly clasped. Her low voice thrilled with feeling as she went on. You love me, and I love you. That is all that matters. I wish it were, Costigan returned bitterly. But you don't know what you'd be letting yourself in for. It's who and what you are and who and what I am that's gripping me. You, Cleo Marston, Curtis Marston's daughter, nineteen years old, you think you've been places and done things. You haven't. You haven't seen or done anything. You don't know what it's all about. And who am I to love a girl like you, a homeless space hound who hasn't been on any planet three weeks and three years, a hard-boiled egg, a troubleshooter and a brawler by instinct and training, a sp he bit off the word and went on quickly. Why, you don't know me at all, and there's a lot of me that you never will know, that I can't let you know. You'd better lay off me, girl, while you can. It'll be best for you, believe me. But I can't, Conway, and neither can you, the girl answered softly, a glorious light in her eyes. It's too late for that. On the ship it was just another of those things, but since then we've come really to know each other, and we're sunk. The situation is out of control, and we both know it. And neither of us would change it if we could, and you know that, too. I don't know very much, I admit. But I do know what you thought you'd have to keep from me, and I admire you all the more for it. We all honor the service, Conway, dearest. It is only you men who have made and are keeping the three planets fit places to live in, and I know that any one of Virgil Sam's assistants would have to be a man in a thousand million. What makes you think that? he demanded sharply. You told me so yourself, indirectly. Who else in the three worlds could possibly call him Sammy? You are hard, of course, but you must be so. And I never did like soft men, anyway. And you brawl in a good cause. You are very much a man, my Conway, a real, real man. And I love you. Now if they catch us, all right. We'll die together at least, she finished intensely. You're right, sweetheart, of course, he admitted. I don't believe that I could really let you let me go, even though I know you ought to, and their hands locked together even more firmly than before. If we ever get out of this jam, I'm going to kiss you, but this is no time to be taking off your helmet. In fact, I'm taking too many chances with you in keeping your shields off. Snap them on again. They ought to be getting fairly close by this time. Hands released and armor again tight, Costigan went over to join Bradley at the control board. How are they coming, Captain? he asked. Not so good. Quite a ways off yet. At least an hour, I'd say, before a cruiser can get within range. I'll see if I can locate any of the pirates chasing us. If I do, it'll be by accident. This little spy ray isn't good for much except close work. I'm afraid the first warning we'll have will be when they take hold of us with a tractor or spear us with a needle. Probably a beam, though. This is one of their emergency lifeboats, and they wouldn't want to destroy it unless they have to. Also, I imagine that Roger wants us alive pretty badly. He has unfinished business with all three of us, and I can well believe that his not particularly pleasant extinction will be even less so after the way we rooked him. 
I want you to do me a favor, Conway. Cleo's face was white with horror at the thought of facing again that unspeakable creature of gray. Give me a gun or something, please. I don't want him ever to look at me that way again, to say nothing of what else he might do while I'm alive. He won't, Costigan assured her, narrow of eye and grim of jaw. He was, as she had said, hard. But you don't want a gun. You might get nervous and use it too soon. I'll take care of you at the last possible moment, because if he gets hold of us, we won't stand a chance of getting away again. For minutes there was silence, Costigan surveying the ether in all directions with his ultra-wave device. Suddenly he laughed, and the others stared at him in surprise. No, I'm not crazy, he told them. This is really funny. It had never occurred to me that the ether walls of all these ships make them invisible. I can see them, of course, with this sub-ether spy, but they can't see us. I knew that they should have overtaken us before this. I've finally found them. They passed us and are now tacking around, waiting for us to do something so that they can see us. They're heading right into the fleet. They think they're safe, of course, but what a surprise they've got coming to them. But it was not only the pirates who were to be surprised. Long before the pirate ship had come within extreme visibility range of the Triplanetary fleet, it lost its invisibility and was starkly outlined upon the lookout plates of the three fugitives. For a few seconds the pirate craft seemed unchanged. Then it began to glow redly, with a red that seemed to become darker as it grew stronger. Then the sharp outlines blurred, puffs of air burst outward, and the metal of the hull became a viscous fluid like something flowing away in a long red streamer into seemingly empty space. Costigan turned his ultra-gaze into that space and saw that it was actually far from empty. There lay a vast something, formless and indefinite even to his sub-ethereal vision, a something into which the viscid stream of transformed metal plunged, plunged and vanished. Powerful interference blanketed his ultra-wave and howled throughout his body, but in the hope that some parts of his message might get through, he called Sam's, and calmly and clearly he narrated everything that had just happened. He continued his crisp report, neglecting not the smallest detail, while their tiny craft was drawn inexorably toward a redly impermeable veil. Continued it until their lifeboat, still intact, shot through that veil and he found himself unable to move. He was conscious. He was breathing normally, his heart was beating, but not a voluntary muscle would obey his will. End of chapter 8